exercise in his business. Yes, and that's my wife. Uh, don't they? Yeah. Yes. And you didn't realize it. Well, good. So <laughs> we moved from. Good yeah. afternoon and welcome to Hudson Institute. Yeah. I'm Ken Weinstein, President and CEO of Hudson Institute. Hudson's mission is to promote U.S. international leadership and global <clears throat> engagement for a secure, free, and prosperous future. And uh, <clears throat> our focus uh, today, of course, is on uh, uh, the question of that ISIS has now been uh, defeated, driven out of Syria and Iraq. And uh, the focus now is on rebuilding the region. And there obviously the backdrop is rather complicated. Uh, there's obviously the geostrategic competition of Iran's presence, Russia's footprint in Syria, uh, tension long-standing tension, obviously, between the Turks and the Kurds. The U.S. Uh, administration, the Trump administration's desire to promote burden sharing as we move into deeper into stability operations, uh, the need to provide security for the Chaldean Christians and to reintegrate them and provide opportunity for them and all the people of the region. And so uh, we have a very distinguished panel of experts uh, with us here today, whom we're going to hear from shortly, uh, Linda Robinson from the Rand Corporation, Loeb. Mikhail from the uh, Iraq Haven Project, Elizabeth Dent from the Middle East Institute, Francis Brown from the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace, and the discussion will be uh, moderated by uh, Hudson Senior Fellow Jonas Pereo Plesner, who's written widely on stability operations here at uh, Hudson, and himself has had some experience as a, as a Danish diplomat uh, uh, in this area of work. But first, we have the honor of hearing from the Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Stabilization, uh, Denise N N Natalie. She has a broad portfolio in this area. She, in fact, just returned from uh, DIFA in Niger, uh, working on reintegration of former uh, Boko Haram uh, members. And she, is, she comes uh, to this uh, area with uh, three decades of experience on the ground in stability operations in countries ranging from Pakistan to uh, Iraq, to northern Iraq in particular. Uh, having worked in the Red Cross, USAID, served at uh, the Institute for National uh, Strategy Studies at uh, the National Defense University. She served as Dean of Students at the American University in Iraq in Soleimaniya, which my, my Hudson Institute colleague uh, Eric Brown serves on the uh, board of. She did her graduate work at, uh, earned her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, did her graduate work at uh, Columbia. She has written numerous award-winning books, and we have the pleasure of hearing from Assistant Secretary Natalie. She's going to offer a keynote of about 10 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, let's welcome Assistant Secretary Natalie to Hudson Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for the kind introduction, and thanks everyone here at the Huston Institute for hosting this very important discussion on Iraq and Syria and post-ISIS stabilization and reconstruction. It's a pleasure to see friends and colleagues here and to be among terrific experts on this issue. Iraq and Syria have faced immense challenges over the past several years, but also have made important progress. As you know, on March 23rd marked the defeat of ISIS's so-called caliphate, with the full liberation of territory once held by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. This victory was only possible through the collective effort of the global coalition to defeat ISIS and the tremendous sacrifice of our partners in Iraq and Syria. That means all components of the Iraqi security forces and the Syrian democratic forces. Still, even with the defeat of ISIS, the threat persists. ISIS remains a determined enemy, as evidenced by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's first appearance years in years this week, exhorting his supporters to keep up the fight despite territorial losses. We still have a lot of work to do to secure the enduring defeat of ISIS and their poisonous ideology. Our ability to ex effectively stabilize and secure liberated communities is arguably a defining moment in the campaign. If unsuccessful, we risk losing past gains. For the United States, a key part of this effort is to consolidate military gains through stabilization activities in Iraq and Syria. Our stabilization strategy is based on key principles laid out in the 2018 Stabilization Assistance Review, otherwise known as the SAR. 
This is a document that my bureau, the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, along with the Bureau of Foreign Assistance, USAID, and DOD, co-authored. The SAR reflects a new approach, and it fulfills this administration's priorities and vision on linking foreign assistance to U.S. national security priorities and achievable results. Simply put, the SAR is a lessons learned document of the past decade of stabilization interventions. It tells us how to do stabilization more effectively and how to judiciously use U.S. taxpayer resources. There are key principles that we apply to our stabilization efforts. The first is tying stabilization assistance to realistic political outcomes that measure impact based on clear data-driven metrics. We will continuously ask and assess how are our efforts advancing U.S. foreign policy. Assistance is not open-ended. The other metrics, start small and short-term and scale up cautiously. Burden sharing, working by, with, and through our local partners and holding them accountable. A key mechanism through which we will work is the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. Since 2014, the Global Coalition has raised more than $20 billion in stabilization, economic, and humanitarian assistance for Iraq and Syria. At a February meeting of coalition partners here in Washington, there was broad consensus that the coalition remains committed to the enduring defeat of ISIS. In other words, the campaign is not over. In Iraq, U.S. support for stabilization program is the center of our strategy to assist the government of Iraq secure military gains and prevent ISIS resurgence. As the campaign transitions, from liberating territory to post-ISIS stabilization, we will continue to work with our allies and partners to build local capacity and to prevent ISIS resurgence. This effort is tied to clear political outcomes. We continue to support a democratic, stable, prosperous, and unified Iraqi state of which the Kurdistan region is an integral part. Along with our coalition partners, we've pioneered a new model of burden sharing called the Funding Facility for Stabilization for Iraq. This is funded by coalition donors, but led by Iraqis and implemented by the UN Development Program. Since 2014, coalition donors, including the United States, have committed more than one billion US dollars to this facility. Following the liberation from ISIS, the immediate priority has been to cement military gains and help set the conditions for the safe and voluntary return of civilians to their homes. The funding facility has prioritized clearing explosive remnants of war and quick impact projects. It is working in 31 liberated localities of Iraq to remove rubble, restore essential services, and refurbish critical infrastructure such as bridges, hospitals, and schools. Just two weeks ago, Coalition partners pledged an additional $200 million for the funding facility, including a pledge from the United States of $100 million. With this recent pledge, the United States now has contributed approximately $365 million to this funding facility. Much of this support is targeted to the Nineveh Plains to stabilize some of the most devastated areas and persecuted and religious and ethnic minorities, such as Christians and Yazidis and other Iraqi groups. This includes helping them heal and setting the stage for economic recovery. Challenges remain. Despite the return of approximately 70% of the internally displaced persons created by ISIS, more than 1.74 million Iraqis remain displaced. Many of the displaced are perceived to be affiliated with ISIS and are not able or willing to return to their homes. Security sector stabilization is also a priority. Bilateral U.S. support to building partner capacity is critical to the Iraqi security forces, including the Peshmerga success. To date, we have trained and equipped more than 190,000 members of the Iraqi security forces. Other members of the Global Coalition are likewise strengthening the security sector through training and advisory work. The, U the European Union Assistance Mission and the new NATO mission, Iraq, complement coalition efforts. However, more civilian security, especially provincial and local police, are needed 
to secure communities in liberated areas and to prevent ISIS resurgence. To ensure durable stability, we must support Iraqi-led efforts to bring undisciplined armed actors that are not under the control of the state under full state control. These armed actors are one of the most serious obstacles to successful stabilization in certain areas. Undisciplined armed actors not under the control of the state are expanding their influence in liberated areas. They obstruct assistance, they stoke sectarian tensions, prevent IDP returns, destabilize local politics, and exacerbate the conflict economy, which in turn may fuel ISIS resurgence. These undisciplined armed actors must be reined in. Anything less will not enable the enduring defeat of ISIS, nor Iraq's full sovereignty. Finally, inequitable service delivery, even perceptions thereof, need to be addressed to mitigate instability. Last year's protests in Basra demonstrate the Iraqi people's desires for service and the lack of patience for perceived corruption. Coalition partners should extend support to Prime Minister Abdel al-Mahdi and the new Iraqi government as they work to address these challenges. Syria, significant work also lies ahead in Syria. Despite impressive combat operations that neutralize thousands of ISIS fighters, thousands more have returned to their communities to former sleeper cells and wait for an opportunity to reemerge. Early in 2019, we saw multiple coordinated attacks in northeast Syria by ISIS cells. As the United States continues to seek a settlement to the Syrian civil war that sets the conditions for refugees to return home and rebuild their lives in safety, we must continue targeted assistance in northeast Syria to help consolidate military gains and prevent ISIS resurgence. Our objective in Syria remains unchanged. We are committed to the enduring defeat of ISIS and al-Qaeda, a political solution to the Syrian conflict in line with UNHCR 2254, and the removal of Iranian-led forces in Syria. In terms of the Syrian regime, this is not about regime change. We support a political process pursuant to UNHCR 2254. Syrian's future depends on a Syrian government taking steps to ensure it is neither a threat to its citizens nor its neighbors. We have drawn and are holding a line between stabilization and reconstruction assistance in Syria. The Assad regime has not earned reconstruction assistance unless it makes necessary reforms and follows UN political process 2254. Much of the stabilization assistance in Syria is being administered by key coalition partners in northeast Syria. We are conducting stabilization activities in towns, villages, and IDP camps throughout Raqqa and Deir al-Zor governorates. This is truly a global effort recognizing the global implications. Since the beginning of the Syrian conflict, the United States has provided approximately 920 million in stabilization assistance throughout Syria, 220 million since the liberation of Raqqa in 2017. This funding, in addition to 180 million contributed by coalition partners, enables programming that remove explosive remnants of war, restores essential services, refurbishes critical infrastructure, and encourages resumed economic activity to help communities recover from ISIS. The enduring defeat of ISIS in Syria will require our continued commitment to stabilization at the local community level. It also requires improved local capacity to provide, oversee, and manage local security and governance in a representative and transparent manner. So, though the needs greatly outweigh current assistance levels. Not only must we continue our ongoing efforts, we must also begin new stabilization and early recovery activities in the recently liberated areas of the middle Euphrates River Valley. One such community is Hajin, where quick impact stabilization programs have already started, and our implementing partners begin improve removing explosive hazards of war just last weekend. As a final note, civilians living in and returning to liberated areas of Syria are those best placed to identify local needs and solutions, and they should also be included in political aspects of stabilization. We must be careful to address the perspectives of conflict-affected groups, such as women and children, 
their roles in their communities, and their relationships to local security forces. In closing, as we work toward the enduring defeat of ISIS, the biggest challenge facing the United States and our coalition partners in Iraq and Syria will be to carefully support legitimate political structures and actors that ensure the sustainability of our collective stabilization efforts. In Iraq, this means supporting the Iraqi government, not only to provide basic services in areas liberated from ISIS, but to facilitate the return of those displaced by ISIS, address the need for the justice of communities who suffered ISIS atrocities, the continued grievances among minority populations, and to restore confidence in Iraqi security institutions' ability to provide these communities with security. In Syria, this means continuing to push for a negotiated solution to political conflict under UNS CR 2254, while continuing expanding our ongoing stabilization efforts in liberated areas. It means setting the conditions so that we can then engage in sustained efforts to restore the social fabric and resiliency of communities who bore the brunt of ISIS atrocities. Again, I would like to recognize the Hassan Institute's contribution to this critical discussion. I look forward to hearing the contributions of my colleagues here and the discussion to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Natalie. I'm Jonas Paul Plessner. Um, uh, Assistant Secretary has been so kind to um, offer the opportunity for also asking some questions um, here from the audience or from the panel. So I'll open it up and um, the usual rules apply. Um, state something that ends in a question and that's relatively short and uh, state name and affiliation if uh, relevant. We have a gentleman standing there. Hello, my name is Jack Pagano. I run a TV station in Afghanistan, Shamshad Radio and Television. We were attacked by ISIS in late 2017. What we're worrying about now is that you feel like you've made an improvement here. Well, the, the ISIS recruits are now moving into Afghanistan. How are you going to stabilize that problem that now that Iraq and Syria are moving from there to Afghanistan? What's your take on that? Thanks for making the problem bigger. We thought we had taken on a big by just adding both Syria and Iraq together, but uh, it seems that we're now broadened out to Afghanistan. I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, not, I, I'm not going to speak specifically to Afghanistan, but I will speak to the way that we are addressing um, the enduring defeat of ISIS. There will be, unfortunately, times where we have territorially defeated ISIS and these waves of insurgent attacks and uh, ISIS coming in. That is why we continue to work with legitimate local partners on the ground, local security forces, so that we can prevent and mitigate the types of resurgences that you are talking about. Great. Other, this gentleman here. Uh, hi. So about the safe zone that the United States, Turkey wants the United States to create in Syria. Uh, the, the Kurds, the your local partners, they are objecting to that idea. Would that affect your stabilization efforts in Syria? Thanks. Thank you. Um, President Trump announced on February 21st a limited number of U.S. forces will remain in northeast Syria to help root out ISIS remnants and prevent its resurgence. Diplomatic engagement with Turkey will continue in order to find a viable solution that addresses Turkey's security concerns, but also protects Syrian Democratic Forces partners. We recognize that they have played an important role uh, in defeating ISIS, and that will continue. Thanks. Other questions from the, down here in the... Thank you very much. Jeff Selden with VOA. I was wondering, how strong are the, the bonds that are connecting the different groups of these sleeper cells, some of the foreign fighters and, and other ISIS components and, and provinces elsewhere in the world. It seems like even with Sri Lanka, there were some connections back to Syria. How does this play into the reconstruction efforts there? And, and how much of a focus, how much can you do in breaking down those connections to allow communities to recover? In general, yes. Again, I'm going to, I'll speak to where we are in Iraq and Syria, but our global coalition 
uh, is addressing these very specific questions that you are asking so that what we are doing in Iraq and Syria, focusing on the enduring defeat of ISIS, preventing its sleeper cells from reemerging, are the ex exact types of threats that the global coalition is addressing in each of its components. And that will continue. Thank you. One more over here. Thank you, Madam, for this. Uh, you talked about uh, undisciplined armed, armed forces. How do you think you are going to discipline arm, undisciplined armed forces where the United States is not controlling the territory? Thank you. When I uh, refer to that word, um, and I'm very sure that my colleague here, uh, Linda Robinson, will address some of that in the panel and the others, uh, in Iraq there is uh, official Iraqi security forces of which many of these actors or popular mobilization units have become part of. When I use the term undisciplined armed actors, I mean any of those armed actors that are not under the control of the Iraqi government. The Iraqi government does have a law in which it has attempted and is incorporating some of these units, but there are many that are not under the control of the Iraqi security forces. It is those particular groups that are posing the most or one of the most biggest obstacles to the stabilization assistance in the liberated areas. It is up to the Iraqi government to, d to address this issue. We are identifying this problem and look forward to uh, supporting in any way we can the Iraqi government to address this issue. We have one last question over here. Or wait for the microphone. <laughs> and the other way around. <laughs> Thank you, Madam and Mr. Secretary. I, I think that just by ending the ISIS is not the, the uh, is not the problem ending Iraq and Syria. What is the problem is there is a middling of the Iranian government by creating sectarian conflict in both in Syria and Iraq. While Iran is there is because we see destructive policy Iran not just there in Yemen and all in Lebanon. I don't see by just ending ISIS. Uh, it's going to be problem in the both country. I want to hear your opinion. Thank you. Is, is there a question? Yes. I think the so question how, was I how you want to how you want to reduce or end Iranian role in both country? How Certainly. You... Thank you. Um, as I indicated, the the United States policy for Iraq is a sovereign, prosperous Iraqi state that is democratic and that it can control its own borders. Um, that means continuing to support the Iraqi government so that it can take full control of its security forces and integrate some of those malign actors into uh, or address some of those threats of the malign actors in ISIS. In Syria, some of our, our, our policy, again, is to assure UNHCR 2254, assure the enduring defeat of ISIS, and to remove all of these Iranian-backed forces, forces from Syria. So that concern of yours is being addressed, and there is, again, to assure the, t the sovereignty and territorial integrity of these, of these states. Thank you. Well, I want all of us once again to thank Assistant Secretary Natalie for coming here, for sharing her thoughts, and for, for engaging in this discussion with us. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we'll go on with the, with the panel discussion. Um, a lot of these big questions have already been opened up um, during both uh, the Secretary's uh, um, comments and also during the questions that you posed. But now I have this sort of stellar panel up here with me that also um, have a lot of viewpoint on this and have a lot of experience in uh, post-conflict stabilization with both uh, Iraq and Syria. So I'll um, introduce them a little bit more and then um, start a discussion with uh, with each of them and then again open it up to the um, to the audience and, and because you're so experienced all of you I have to sort of uh, make sure that I get everything right so immediately here to my left I have Linda Robinson um, who is a senior international defense researcher at the Rand Corporation um, has really long-standing experience with uh, stabilization uh, and her current research centers on assessing the US national security strategy uh, and campaign to counter the uh, ISIS, the global coalition in Iraq and Syria. Um, she's made uh, more than or 26 visits to Iraq since 2003, um, and her latest publication is Making Victory Count After Defeating ISIS, and have 
done several assessments of the sort of of the ISIS campaign. Um, then I have next to her, I have Frances Brown, who's a fellow now with the Carnegie uh, Democracy Conflict and Governance Program, and she was previously director on the National Security Council uh, staff, both during the Obama and the Trump administration, and also worked in the USAID Office of Transition Initiatives. Um, and um, has worked, again, widely on this issue and, and will, I think, specifically also want to address S Syria. Then I have um, Ryan Mikhail, who's a senior advisor with the Iraq Haven uh, Project um, and head of the foreign relations of the Chaldean Syriac Assyrian Popular Council. Um, so, of course, has a, a lot of experience what goes on in the ground uh, in Iraq in these areas, particularly the return of uh, refugees and particularly minorities uh, to some of the ISIS devastated areas. Uh, last but definitely not least, we have Elizabeth Dent, who is a scholar at the Middle East Institute uh, countering terrorism and extremism program, and uh, previously worked at the Department of State in uh, the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS, where I had uh, the pleasure of uh, working also with Liz and her uh, uh, boss, Brett McGurk, um, when I was also a Danish uh, diplomat um, serving here in Washington and uh, uh, working on those issues. So this is, um, again, a really a lot of experience we have uh, assembled on the question of post-conflict uh, stabilization uh, in Iraq and, and Syria. Um, as Ken Weinstein mentioned in, in the introduction, it is, of course, links into the bigger question. If it's Syria, there is the question of that there is still no peace, uh, that uh, the next phase after the stabilization reconstruction is not something that the sort of the uh, Western world wants to give to us at. Uh, that, um, so there's a question to what degree can you drive uh, forward progress only with, with uh, post-conflict stabilization. In Iraq, it links into all these broader questions of reconciliation, of uh, the question as, as uh, diplomatically, Assistant Secretary Natalie put it these, or was it non-armed, outside of government control uh, actors? And um, so all these, of course, questions link into um, how successful uh, any post sort of conflict uh, stabilization will be in these countries. On the other hand, I think we also have to see both the whole global coalition as, as somewhat of a, uh, of a success. In another period, it might have been called a coalition of the willing, and it, it, w it really was like both of local forces and of international uh, forces, and with some, and across in the US, across two administrations, first in the Obama administration and uh, followed on in, in the Trump administration and with a sort of aim uh, that the military gains, as the Second Secretary also underlined, should really be followed up by a sort of stabilization on the ground, but with new ideas of, of a much stronger burden sharing and, and sort of with the US in a much sort of lighter footprint uh, role. So I think that will also be one of the topics we'll discuss. Can you do uh, more with less, and when does the sort of point come when you, when it's, it's, it's too little? I think that discussion has been very prevalent around President Trump's decision first to completely withdraw militarily from Syria, then slightly reverse to stay with the smaller. Are you still able to fill all the objectives, including on, on post-conflict stabilization um, with smaller military uh, means? But I'll, uh, this is exciting topic, so these were just like teasers to, um, so I'll ask um, each of my panelists here to give their initial thoughts, both on, of course, Assistant Secretary Natalie, her speech and the administration as approach, specifically about the challenges faced in uh, both Iraq and, and in Syria, and whether we can already draw some sort of lessons learned about how successful we've been in, in post-conflict uh, stabilization. So Linda, I'll turn it over to you first. Thank you, Jonas. And I want to thank the Hudson Institute as well. I think it's so important that this meeting is occurring because I believe with the uh, announcement that the physical caliphate, so-called caliphate, has been dislodged, it, it is te the tendency is to turn away and check the block and say, uh, we finished that problem, let's move ahead. And I, I commend the, all of you taking your time to come and uh, discuss this. We've already had a good start, I think, to the discussion. What I'd like to do is just pick up on 
our approach in our report was really to, to kind of bin the various stabilization issues into IDP's uh, return to normal life, which includes things like housing, infrastructure services, and security and governance. And I'll just make a few points updating uh, what I believe the current situation is. Uh, but first I want to say there is, there is still a fight going on. Uh, they, the attack trends which I monitor have remained um, worldwide about 300 casualties and 50 attacks weekly. This is um, a, a high toll for a group that many of us may think is on the wane. That's still significant. And what's also important when you look at the numbers, the great majority, uh, majority of those attacks have always and are still occurring in Iraq and Syria. To the tune of 76% of the attacks are in Iraq and Syria and 64% of the casualties. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize this is still core ISIS is the main game still in terms of the, the threat. And so continued attention needs to be paid uh, to those areas. Notwithstanding, of course, the Sri Lankan attack just showed still the ability to mount worldwide uh, attacks. So on the stabilization front, it's quite critical that 1.7 million Iraqis still remain displaced. And met the majority of those have been displaced longer than three years. And the rest of those surveyed don't see any prospect of going home within the year, the great majority. So what is the number one problem they cite? No housing. Their housing's been destroyed totally or partially, and the rebuilding effort is not sufficiently funded. Part of that is, I think, still there's demining and some other things, services, jobs. It's a complex web of issues, but I wanted to just call attention to the housing problem. And we did a video when we went back last year on West Mosul, and we, while East Mosul is quite vibrant, West Mosul, you think of a World War II type uh, uh, landscape. It's, it's quite bombed out, and we, uh, we have to remember those people uh, need a place to go. Um, I'll, I'll address security at, at a little bit greater uh, length, but I think the governance issue is critically important. We now have a new governor or go government in Nineveh. Um, the governor, unfortunately, there was a tragedy in Nauru's. As some of you who follow this closely understand, there was a capsized ferry. 90 people died. The governor was sacked. He was actually quite a big problem, an impediment to some of the stabilization and reconstruction projects. So they've got a chance now uh, with a fresh start there. But it's important to look at governance issues, not just nationally, but locally. Competent governance governance at the government or province level is, is critical for these programs to move forward. And it's a great thing that, that Denise, who's really, I'm, I can't commend her, um, her work in this uh, arena enough, but it's, it's important to note that the stabilization program has really been delegated down. In their 17 years of war, we made a lot of mistakes with high dollar projects that were um, delegated at high levels, not down at the ground, where local officials and local people could say, here's our priority, this is what we want. And that's now been codified in the SAR, the Stabilization Assistance Review, which is the first time you've had a US government policy uh, signed by state, US aid, and DOD that says we all understand how stabilization should be done. So that is a huge uh, achievement bureaucratically. Um, services, I would just say, and there are many statistics I can give, but there's a real lack of services, and of course there's a flashing orange to red light with the electricity as summer is coming, and this is of course what sparked not only the riots in uh, Basra uh, last year, but we will see unrest all over the country, including in these areas where people are, are living in tents and don't have uh, uh, sufficient wherewithal. So, so that is a very critical need. That intersects, and we've already had some questions about Iran, and this of course intersects. All of these issues are interconnected. 40% of Iraq's electricity comes from um, Iran, 
either from uh, electricity directly imported or gas that is then used to produce uh, the electricity. And the uh, US government in March offered the, another 90-day waiver in its uh, efforts to try to get uh, Iraq to stop importing that uh, electricity and that gas. It is a technical problem. It's going to take a while for Iraq to move off of that. And so the waiver is justified. But ultimately, what you need is, in my view, the Gulf states to help provide a bridging solution so that Iraq can. It, it is woefully short of electricity. So it's not only that it's dependent on Iran. It has an extreme shortage that technical measures, and we, in my view, should also be providing as much technical advice as we can to support that transition to both fulfill the needs and reduce the dependence on, on Iraq. Um, I want to address briefly the security uh, issue, because it is, uh, it's important to note that it's not just a problem with the um, Iranian-backed groups or undisciplined armed groups, the, it's not just a euphemism. I think it's a good characterizing phrase to say undisciplined armed actors not under the control of the state. Um, they're not all Shia. Some are Sunni. They're not all controlled or influenced by Iran. So there's a, a group of uh, entities out there that are a problem. We've mapped them. We know where they are located. We know what they are doing in consolidating control in areas that is only going to provide uh, seeds for future conflict. So I estimate all of this complex of problems, we have about six to 12 months before a kind of full-blown insurgency could come back to life and, and a level of violence that will go beyond what the state is capable of managing. I think it's very important to acknowledge that the Popular Mobilization Forces, or PMUs, whatever your favorite term is, they are, as Denise said, there's a law. They uh, exist under law. Their salaries are now commensurate with that of the Iraqi Security Forces. Um, and they report to the prime minister's office, which is what for many years the Iraqi Special Operations Forces did. They are, were very much the heroes of this uh, latest campaign. They performed well. They now have their own ministry. My question is, and I think the way to go at this issue is some very pragmatic issues. Does Iraqi need, should it have, can it fund four separate security forces? Does that make sense? Should this PMF eventually, those who are qualified, competent, motivated, and go through a vetting process, go into one of the other security forces? Uh, by law and by constitution, there are not supposed to be any militias in Iraq. And I witnessed at a February conference there what a very uh, interesting spectacle of Iraqis standing up in a conference and peppering Kais Kazali, one of the militia leaders, with questions. He's also a parliamentarian, so he's now a politician. He has a party. He also has a militia. And the questions were, the emergency's over. Why do we need militias? Why do we have political leaders? Why do we have so many? Uh, what about abuses? Who's controlling them? And that's what you want a democracy to do. And so to me, the key is, how do we get behind that Iraqi sentiment and try to help them fashion a solution? So I think I, I probably exceeded my time here, and I apologize. We can talk about Syria more. Very critical, high-level policy issues, but covering up the fact that we have 125,000 IDPs and intermixed with foreign fighters and foreign fighter collaborators. Thanks a lot, Linda. Um, this was really great, and I thought I liked particularly the example on, on uh, Iraqi electricity, how basically the bigger picture of geopolitics that we also talked about and was raised as a question how to sort of curb Iranian influence and how that also very links to uh, short-term needs and stabilization that, that of course people need electricity as well in their, in their homes. So I will turn to, to Francis as, as next here. Sure, great, yeah, it, and really it's a pleasure to be here. I thank the Hudson Institute and Jonas for convening all of us, and I, I echo Linda, I think it's so important to keep our eyes on the ball of these challenges going forward. Um, the, the lifts are heavy, and, and it's a really important endeavor for US national interests uh, and for the Iraqi and Syrian people. Um, so I'm going to uh, go on over the border to the rather porous border uh, to Syria and focus on challenges and stabilization there in my remarks. I want to do basically three things. I want to 
first lay out how stabilization efforts fit into the broader U.S. toolkit in Syria, the, the broader U.S. forms of leverage to achieve our objectives. Second, I want to look more closely at the civilian stabilization programs in Syria, as well as how that relates to the stabilization assistance review that the Assistant Secretary mentioned and that Linda echoed as well. And third, I want to lay out a few recommendations and lessons on sort of where do we go from here on Syria stabilization. Um, so to start just on the big picture of, of U.S. tools and leverage in Syria to achieve our objectives and where stabilization nests within that. So uh, as the Assistant Secretary mentioned, there are three articulated goals for U.S. policy in Syria. They are, first of all, the enduring defeat of ISIS, recognizing that the military caliphate's defeat uh, is just one part of that. Second, it is uh, irreversible progress on a political uh, resolution in line with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. Uh, this this uh, relates to the UN Special Envoy's work as well and the Geneva process. Uh, and the third stated US objective is stamping out of Iranian influence in Syria. So what are our tools to achieve these goals uh, and, and sort of where does stabilization fit within this? Uh, to my mind, we've got a number of important tools or forms of leverage in Syria right now. We've got, first of all, the facts on the ground. As you all know, uh, we've got US troops uh, still in the east of the country, uh, combined with our Syrian Democratic Force partners, uh, and, they, and they hold a large swath of territory. This is, this is significant not only for the territory itself, but for the natural resources, the agrarian resources available uh, in this area. So that's considerable leverage. Second of all, yes, we've got the military forces as well. There's obviously been a lot of focus in the last few months about the numbers, the troop numbers, in or out. Uh, will allies come in and take our place? Uh, but and I'll discuss that more in a minute. But yes, mil military force does give us a form of leverage. Uh, third, we've got our diplomatic uh, tools. We, With the uh, arrival of Ambassador James Jeffrey last fall, I think we've seen sort of a rejuvenate, rejuvenation of the diplomatic process. Uh, he's got very energetic leadership along with his colleagues at the State Department. Uh, third, we ha next we have civilian assistance tools, so the stabilization uh, that I'll talk about a little bit more la later. This is in addition to providing important goods on the ground. This also gives us a form of influence. Uh, next, we have economic tools. We've got sanctions that we're undertaking. Uh, we've got the potential in some future arrangement of reconstruction funding or not, so economic leverage. And then finally, I would say that US leverage comes from the sense of credibility that we bring, the sense that we can convene partners, the sense that we mean what we say, sort of all the, all the powers attendant to a superpower like the US. So those are our, our tools to achieve stabilization and other outcomes in Syria. And I would say if we were having this panel a year and a little bit ago, mm -hmm. I would have said that we, uh, we were in a pretty good position to achieve some of our outcomes in, in Syria, or salvage a somewhat better outcome in Syria. Not to make uh, it a, you know, a perfect success, but um, that these are pretty important cards to play. I will say that in the past uh, year, I think we have undermined our position considerably on this front. Uh, the very public waffling over whether our troops will be in or out I think has undermined the, the sense that we are ready to see this through and shape outcomes on the ground. Uh, and the president's most recent um, announcement in December, uh, which publicized that he would like US troops to, to leave, has seemingly been partially walked back by the interagency. But I think that the important thing here is that the perceptions that matter are the perceptions on the ground of both our adversaries on our ground and our partners on the ground. And they have heard loud and clear that the president does not want us to be there, even if we manage to make some sort of commensurate, almost commensurate force in terms of other allied contributions. I think that significant damage has been done there. Uh, second of all, on the diplomatic front, um, like I said, I think we've seen a, a really ambitious and energetic uh, diplomatic effort, which is all to the good. I also think that diplomatic effort is being siphoned off in lots of different directions that uh, impede progress on our core objectives. What I mean by this is that uh, the diplomatic team has had to be, in addition to negotiating the political transition in Syria or the political dispensation in Syria, it has uh, had to be now working, as was mentioned earlier, working on the so-called safe zone issue, negotiating with Turkey on that, negotiating with Turkey on the S-400 issue, on now the Iranian oil waiver issue, 
also looking for more troop contributing uh, allies, and, and then finally looking at the foreign fighter issue. So in short, there are a lot of diplomatic fish to fry, and I think this is undermining uh, our ability to sort of marshal all of our diplomatic tools. Um, and then finally, I think the messaging in general of our sort of questionable commitment to this has, has made our lift harder on this. So that's US tools, US objectives. Now I want to drill down a little bit onto the stabilization front. So um, as the Assistant Secretary mentioned, the US has been providing uh, considerable and essential, very important pro programs on the ground uh, for newly liberated communities. Uh, demining, ru rubble removal, water, sanitation, essential services, electricity, uh, livelihoods. So there's, there's a ton that's going on that is really important in making people's lives better on the ground, ultimately, hopefully, setting the conditions to allow more to return. Um, so that's all, um, that's all tremendously important work. I, um, the second thing I will say on this is that as the Assistant Secretary mentioned, uh, the U.S. government has made a lot of progress in general on the stabilization review and setting out sort of how do we do stabilization in general? What is our theory of how stabilization is best done? Uh, that document, which was published last year, and my hat's off really to the interagency colleagues who drafted that document, that document lays out a definition of stabilization, which is that is an inherently political process um, driving towards a closely defined, realistically defined political end state um, and, such that local authorities can manage conflict peacefully. This is an excellent definition of what stabilization does. This is not at all what our stabilization programs in Syria are doing. Uh, our stabilization programs in Syria are uh, purposefully not empowering the local authorities because uh, there's tremendous complications on the uh, the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Council, on the ground. So we've chosen to not try to entrench them as, as a long-term governing presence. Um, our, our programs on the ground are in, uh, intentionally not taking a political approach. Uh, that's, that's not what they're doing. And, and so it's, it's, there's a little bit, little bit of a gap between our sort of official definition and our what's actually happening on the ground here. Um, and finally, I don't think we have a clearly defined political end state that we are driving towards in eastern Syria. Um, we've sort of d deferred questions on that, or there seems to be tremendous co uh, confusion on the ground. So this is not to pick on the Syria policymakers. I was one. <laughs> um, I, but just to point out the tremendous complications of what stabilization in Syria entails. It's, we heard how heavy a lift it is in Iraq, and I would venture to say it's maybe even more complicated in Syria just because of these, uh, these issues. Um, so finally, a few recommendations, a few lessons learned on. So if we're going to do stabilization in Syria, what, what can we know, learn from other contexts and from the Syrian context about how to achieve some of our objectives? So I would, I would summarize this in terms of security, grievances, oversight, modesty, and local authorities. Uh, so first on security, the assistant secretary mentioned there's you know, still sleeper cells. There's concern about security deteriorating. So this is, um, I think this will continue to be a challenge going for forward. Other studies and other uh, conflict environments have looked at sort of when development projects, which is a lot of these stabilization projects, when do they actually help diminish violence? And one of the findings is that you need a modicum of security first before you can actually um, hope that these projects will further decrease vi violence. My own research on Syria, looking backwards at stabilization projects over the last eight years in, uh, in the US and other donors in particular, um, one of the things I found is that often we were asking civilian projects, stabilization projects, support to local councils um, to serve a role that really was impossible for them to serve without security backing. So we would be hoping that local councils would stand up to armed extremist groups or ISIS. But without adequate security backing, uh, unsurprisingly, that, that wasn't possible. I think thinking about security and the security backbone to stabilization is especially important as we think about going down the middle Euphrates River Valley, as the Assistant Secretary mentioned. Um, it's, you know, it's tremendously important to get civilian services in there. At the same time, if there's not a sort of credible security backing to that, uh, I, think, I think there's a bit of a moral hazard there in, in what we're asking those civilian partners to do. Uh, the second note, note recommendation I'd say is I would shorthand it grievances, but it's really about looking beyond the sort of immediate needs of civilians on the ground 
essential as those are, to also look at sense of agency, sense of anger, sense of injustice. These are things that we've learned the world over are part of an essential countering violent extremism uh, program, part of an important stabilization program. It's not just meeting the sort of physical needs. It's also getting at these broader issues. I would suspect that's particularly the case when, since we're talking about the massive number of um, children, small children in a whole camp and elsewhere. So there, there's going to be a massive need for sort of soft programming, psychosocial programming, uh, programming that gets at, at these challenges. Uh, and that'll be a large scale. So I, I know there's recognition of that in, in the government and in other donor governments. So um, I think that'll be an important one to watch. Uh, the next thing I'll mention is oversight. So civilian oversight is really important. Um, it's been shown to be really important for making whatever projects we've got um, actually achieve objectives and help quell violence. Uh, in the US, we've had the Start Forward platform, uh, which sort of got oversight into Syria. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that perhaps that can be rejuvenated going forward. Uh, next is small dollar amounts. Uh, I think this is probably not a concern in Syria, but as Linda referenced, sort of the days of industrial scale stabilization taught us that industrial scale stabilization uh, often has pernicious unintended consequences. So smaller projects that are locally driven. And finally, I, um, I would say underscoring again sort of what the SAR says, what the Stabilization Assistance Review says, we need stabilization to empower local actors and local authorities towards a politically defined end state. Um, I, think, I think all of our sort of programmatic level work in Syria towards stabilization needs to be in service of some perhaps more clearly defined political end state. Otherwise, the concern is that we're just treading water um, and not achieving the strategic objectives that we all want. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Francis. <laughs> this was uh, great. Very uh, cogent <clears throat> um, policy and uh, with recommendations and everything. I will now turn to Lual, which, of course, will uh, focus, um, I imagine, quite a bit on, on Iraq. Um, I mean, when we look at this sort of overall uh, results of, of stabilization. Iraq is, is often now mentioned because four million people actually have already returned to sort of the areas of, uh, that were formerly under ISIS control, and that is somewhat of a sort of um, success. But that, of course, obscures many of the real difficulties on the ground, particularly for uh, minorities as well in, in returning, a situation that you know really well. So I would um, love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for Hudson. Uh, for this panel, also our uh, secret, uh, assistant secretary and then our colleague and panel cover a lot of what's going on in Iraq and Syria, and I I, I don't want to repeat <laughs> many of these things. Uh, I just want to say uh, about the stabilization in Iraq and maybe in Syria as well that well, actually there was no plan for post defeating ISIS in 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 first place that what we should do after defeating ISIS. Nobody thought about prior population planning prevent piss poor performance, you know, like. Uh, so uh, that wa that's why in first place we had a referendum, we had an airport closing, we had a lot of, lot of problems in, in the beginning, and everybody was, everybody was thinking that if we defeat ISIS, that is, we are going to enter to the new era with, with uh, reconciliation, uh, we're going to have prosperity, economy, and, and but, but nobody thought about what is next step. That's why we had chaos after defeating ISIS. Like we had a forces from nobody knows they, where they come from to those areas. We had a conflict. You, you heard about in, in Kirkuk, in, in Ninveh Plain, in other areas that there was a clash between uh, Peshmerga and, and, and PMU and I, ISF. So, so there was a, a really chaos on, on there. Uh, that's why we, we, we don't know till now where we are on, 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 uh, on, on that areas. So, uh, but anyway, that, that's happened what happened. Uh, I, I just want to say that uh, uh, we have a new government in the place that being elected by Iraqi people. And it's unfortunately, I want to say, still not complete, but it's functioning. I mean, we don't, we don't have defense minister. We don't have interior minister. But if you look to the government right now we have on the place, for example, President Barzani two, three weeks ago said we had a wise man, good man on the place, uh, head of the government, Adil Abdel Mahdi, that we can work, we believe we can work with, and we can move forward. Uh, we can speak about stabilization 
helping uh, uh, minorities, helping IDPs, helping whatever. But we first need, we, we, we need really first to come together in Iraq. That's why like, you can, you can, there's a tremendous organizations that are doing work, USAID, you, many of you guys are doing on the ground work. But if you look, if you go and see what tangible has been done, not so much really. Uh, Nineveh plan still, still destroyed. Mosul is, is, is devastated by the war on ISIS. Ambar, other places. I mean, you cannot help. It's, you cannot call it uh, destabilizing, only helping people, give them food. No. You need, we need to come together. We need uh, Baghdad, Erbil to come together. We need the policymakers to come together. That will create a stabilization in Iraq. Otherwise, we can still... Send aid. There are, as you, as she, secret, Assistant Secretary mentioned, see that the Baghdadi appeared in a clip video. That uh, a lot of people that will be motivated again. That uh, if if uh, if the Sunnis still feel uh, frustrated and depressed by some forces on the ground, they will still see potential to come, to rise again. So uh, uh, I just want to also. So the the post conflict stabilization, we need to come together. Because there is still conflict, we cannot uh, fix things by giving aid, providing shelter. No, uh, we need to politically understand each other and 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 make sure what is uh, my role, what is this everybody's role on the state, and and build cohesive, uh, comprehensive government together, and and everybody uh, c come with something. Uh, so uh, uh, reconstruction, uh, as I'm telling you, reconstruction. Iraq has been like many areas, many provinces, governorates, are 80%, 90% being destroyed. And, and people, if you go and see the people on the streets, if you talk to them, they are frustrated. Doesn't matter who is the prime minister, doesn't matter who the speaker, doesn't matter who's that and that. The people want to have a life. The people, they want, they want to have tangible life. They want a services, they want electricity, they want a security, they want all of these things, you know? I mean, uh, we can speak about it until t tomorrow, but if you don't do something, if there is a no well by the coalition, by the United States themselves, by the Iraqi forces, by the Iraqi government, the Kurds, if there is a no well to do something and to help people, uh, how, how can we get out of this, uh, out of this problem? For example, now, uh, the, the campaign on pressuring on Iran about the, uh, the economic uh, sanctions, things. I mean, this creates tension between now Iraq, uh, United States gov uh, relations, as we saw the uh, uh, Ministry of, of, of Interior Affairs issuing statement, speaking with, with embassy that to withdraw a statement they made about Iran. I mean, we need to think logically here, out of, out of passion. I don't like most of the Iraqi, Iraqi uh, uh, force Iraqi political figures, they don't think, uh, like they put their passions first. I mean, you don't have to be passionate about Iran because you can have relations with Iran, you, ha you can have religious ties with Iran, but you need to act independently. You need to have your own decision for your own people. Don't let others to make their, I mean, decision for you. Reconciliation, USIP has been doing a lot of uh, a lot of reconciliation round table on the ground to bring the Sunni, Shia, uh, Christians, other together, uh, which has been helpful. But we want to see that on, on more large scale, doing, do, uh, like being conducted by UN, being conducted by other, other players on the ground to, be, to say that, OK, there's a real well to bring all those people together. There's a reconciliation, national reconciliation, that they can work together. That's really important for us. Uh, good governance is like, um, as I'm telling you, we have a good speaker on the place, the man. I met him on, on, on Washington, D.C. We, spoke, we spoke about Iraq. We spoke about how can we bring investors, reconstruction. Those people, um, many of them are good, are very good, right people on the right place, but they need to still to make their own decisions. And I mean, they, they need to make, they need to come up with a plan how to move forward. Uh, because, uh, for example, I want to, like, uh, uh, Falh al-Fayyad, who's, like, 
there was a lot of arguing about him to be uh, Minister of Interior, you know? So until now, he's not minister. I mean, he was the, the prime minister. He was in Germany. And Falah al Fayyad was with him in delegation. And this man is not in a cabinet. So that brings a, a, a question mark on my head. Like, what is this guy doing there? Is it like because they want to watch the prime minister or something? You know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm curious to know that. So this is, uh, uh, but, but I'm t still telling you, we have a good prime minister. We have a speaker, great parliament, uh, 70, 80% of the uh, parliament members are new, which many of them has a well to do something on the ground to change. Uh, so um, return of minorities. USAID has been is doing as much as they can on the ground. But if you think, if you look to the what's going on in Iraq deeply, if you dive on the problem, Iraq is. Be, I mean, those special those areas which there are those forces on there like uh, PMU, Hajj Shabi, who are in, in a lot of areas, and so many of them they report to prime minister in, in principle. Uh, uh, in in in, you know, thirty percent. Like USAID want to do something, we want to do something, like we want to bring investors. But if you look to the problem, there's a shell. The, the area is covered by the shell, which is security shell. Like whatever you do, it hits on this shell and comes back to you without, without doing any impact on the life, on the, on the life's people on the ground, you know? So that's, that's why many, that's why we need we need uh, indigenous nature of the security plan on the ground. Under whether Iraq flag or Kurdistan flag, we don't have problem with that. And we prefer to go with the central government, uh, like everything to be controlled by central, like, every, like we as a forces wanted to go under central government, we don't have problem. But if we create a plan for those people, for indigenous people to be there, we need to make sure that those people, they stay there, they will not be used as a proxy wars in different areas. For example, there are three, four Christian militias that they, are, they, they can go under Iraqi flag and be able to have an arm and secure their, their communities. But those, we believe those in the future, they will be used in some areas as a proxy wars. You know? So um, we in Iraq Haven, we came, with an, we came up with an idea, it's called Special Secured Economic Zones. Uh, we believe that since 2003 until now, it's, a, it's been difficult to deal with Iraq, to build whole Iraq, because there's a no Marshall Plan or something like that. So we, we, we thought that we need to pick some certain areas, and, and those areas need to be revitalized, and, there should be, and those areas should have special secure economic uh, zones, you know. Like uh, we can do one in Ambar, we can do one in Basra, we can do one in, uh, in, in Inver Plain, we can do one in Slemania, no problem. Uh, but, but those special secured economic zones, I mean, uh, uh, Iraq should allow that to happen because if you create zone economically, you can expand it, you can create jobs. You can bring people to homes and towns, but if there is a no job, there is, if, 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 you, if you need to make those IDPs, those refugees to restore their dignities, give them job. Don't, don't give them food, don't give them fish. Teach them how to fish. I mean, those people, they used to have jobs. They used to have uh, 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 shops. They used to have everything. They're doctors, they're engineers. And now we, we just keep feeding them with the food, with nothing, as sheep, you know? And, I mean, this is what they see themselves. So they need to restore their dignity by giving them jobs. We need to give them, uh, we need to create this thing. So uh, we, we, came, uh, like, uh, we thought that indigenous nature of the security plan uh, it's, a, it's a part of uh, special economic zones. Uh, Public-private partnership involving both governments, Baghdad and Erbil. All private uh, uh, funding scales quickly la uh, less danger of malinvestment. Iraq has been suffering by malinvestment. A lot of money a lot of been, has been waste. Uh, once, one one-stop shop eliminates corruption and uh, uh, compliance risk. Uh, in, in investors, uh, participant, common law, governance rights, such as London, Dubai, and others. You know, so I leave it by there. I believe uh, we can we can re reconstruct Iraq by special economic zones, and we have been giving this idea to the speaker, uh, uh, ambassador of of Iraq uh, to United States, uh, Yasin. 
He, we, we brief him about the plan, and he's one of our friends in embassies here right now also. Uh, so I hope we can do something. Thanks, Bill. Th thanks for, for that, and also for, for giving us an outline of your specific proposal with, uh, with the special economic zones. I'll turn uh, now to Liz. It's, of course, always um, being last, but then you have at least advantage, and you've heard all the others, what they're saying. So um, you can fill in some of the gaps that, you, that you've seen and, and bring those into the debate. So great to have you on, on as well. Thanks, Jonas. It's great to be here, and thank you to the Hudson Institute for having me. Um, as Jonas will tell you, this is my first time on a panel, so I'm truly honored to be up here with you all and not be staffing somebody who's on a panel. Um, I want to pull back just a bit and talk about um, the US policy perspective um, and the Global Coalition's policy perspective when it came to um, creating a stabilization policy for areas that were going to be liberated from ISIS. Um, it was always a very narrow scope um, we even jokingly would call it stabilization light because it was so heavily focused on um, demining buildings, getting the lights turned back on, getting people access to water, um, doing things that we knew that we could do that would create that environment where IDPs could voluntarily return. Um, this was never, from a coalition perspective, going to be a large reconstruction effort, particularly in Syria, as we've discussed. Um, Moving into Iraq specifically, um, what's different about Iraq is, one, we have a government, so we can actually work with them, which means the United Nations can come in and do things that we can't do in Syria. Um, two, we're actually invited there um, by the local government. Um, and the UNDP and the government of Iraq worked to implement a lot of these programmings for things that UNDP had done studies on of where the high-risk areas were. Um, so some of those successful projects were you know, water treatment facilities, um, getting the demining done so that people could come back in. This particular was useful in, in Mosul, where we had over a million people um, who were displaced. Um, but the biggest threats to the stabilization effort in Iraq are, one, of course, if, if we don't follow through on this very limited scope policy, um, it can unravel very quickly. Um, 1.7 million, over 1.7 million remain displaced in Iraq. This is a, a big problem because most of these, as was already mentioned, are people that either have no intention of going home or are, are unable to go home. Um, corruption, money mismanagement, we mentioned the firing of Governor Knopfel. That was a long time coming. Um, he was particularly known for that. Um, so also um, efforts to divide funding and stabilization priorities. This administration in particular has had a heavy focus on Christian communities, um, which is great. And Christian communities need to be rebuilt, and Christians need to be protected. But as my colleague just mentioned, that is not possible unless there is a security um, and, and stability on the ground in those Christian communities. Most Christians don't want to return because that security isn't there quite yet. So we're throwing money at a problem that, that we can't fix because we're not actually focused on the correct thing. Um, for the larger reconstruction effort in, in Iraq, in February 2017, we had a huge conference where $30 billion was pledged by countries around the world, by the EU, the World Bank, um, so that's being implemented by those partners, and that is not a coalition US-led effort. In fact, I don't think the US pledged anything at all. It was more of loans and forgiveness. Um, so we're hoping to rely on that. Of course, all of this does not work if Iraqi governance is in question, if the security element is, that, is not there. Um, what we've really done well in Iraq is ensuring that Iraqi security forces are trained, as the Assistant Secretary mentioned. Um, the Iraqi counterterrorism services are trained well and are providing some of that security, going after sleeper cells, um, and we're able to keep our presence on the ground in order for them to do that. Um, moving into Syria, this was even far more limited than what we were doing in Iraq because we didn't have a government. We, we didn't have any sort of ability to bring the UN in and have them do studies on the ground of where the best places to implement funding were. We were relying very heavily on councils that we had stood up um, that were not um, permanent and that had pledged to a political process um, forthcoming to hold elections then um, after that. So again, they knew they were temporary. Everybody else knew they were temporary. It was very difficult for them to kind of focus on, on how this all worked. Um, plus, of course, with the, um, the problems around Turkey and you know some of the council's affiliations with the SEC um, or the Autonomous Administration. Um, it was a very complicated situation on the ground. Um, but 
we were still focused on, on demining and getting people home and them having access to water and getting the lights turned back on, um, clearing rubble and, and dead bodies, which is a very you know, difficult, long task. Um, and we also focused on school refurbishment. And this was largely at the behest of the local councils who said, hey, we want all of this and we want people to come home, but none of this matters if the kids are just running around doing nothing. So we did expand that scope a bit. Um, for the limited way that we define, the US defined stabilization in those countries, um, in areas liberated from ISIS, uh, we were pretty successful, um, particularly in Iraq. Uh, but we were doing OK in Syria. <laughs> there are two big decisions that derailed this. Okay, um, Trump pulling back the 200 million that Tillerson pledged in February 2017. Um, this was a problem because, yes, while the United States was doing the majority of the work when it came to the military effort in both Iraq and Syria, and coalition partners were doing the majority of the work for stabilization funding, um, the United States not giving any money to stabilization funding in Syria made it look like we were not committed. Lo and behold, two months later, Trump says, I, I think we're pretty close to getting out of Syria. This causes everything to start shaking. December 2018, Trump says we're getting out of Syria. Um, I know that's been walked back, but the problem is that it has eroded not just the trust of the international community to provide funding to these efforts that we were implementing on the ground, but also to the local councils who and, and our partners on the ground who are saying, well, how, why would we do what you're telling us to do? We have no idea if you're going to be here tomorrow. Um, so that is something that I think the US is really struggling with currently. For a while there, after the announcement in December, stabilization activities halted. Um, in Syria in particular. And um, the difficult part was to get those restarted after we had walked back our announcement, because a lot of NGOs had left um, and had started to fire people, because we couldn't fund them. We couldn't provide the security environment, because we had planned to leave. Um, so that is a huge problem. Most notably, uh, the UK announced they were pulling back the funding that they had pledged to Northeast Syria a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think this will continue to erode. It's just, it's just impossible for us to have that sort of US credibility that you were talking about, Francis, um, when we've been unable to follow through on any of this. Um, reconstruction funding, as the Assistant Secretary mentioned, no reconstruction funding until there's a political process. But even in some statements, the Trump administration has alluded to no reconstruction funding even if Assad stays in power. So even if there's a political process, but the political process means that Assad stays in power and there's some sort of um, you know, renovation of the government, they still might not contribute. So that's a problem. Um, our biggest issue in Syria is that we continue to raise the bar of what our objectives are without following up with the resources or the means to actually do that. So the three policy objectives that we've discussed many times now um, in the last hour are really difficult to do when you have 200 to 1,000 troops on the ground and you're not providing any funding. Um, I, I think it's still kind of unclear how many troops are going to remain, but regardless, it's still either 10% of what we were, what we had before, or 30%. And that's not, that is not enough when you're talking about one third of the entire country of Syria to be able to implement this stuff. Um, because of that, we're probably going to continue to see a degradation in the security environment. Um, I think that the SDF and the local council's legitimacy comes from our presence and our ability to provide the security and the, um, the comfort that we're staying and so that they can continue to move on because we're going to take care of them. Um, and I think that that is, is going to erode very quickly. We're already seeing a rise in ICE tax. Um, and I think local councils and even locals um, pushing back on the SDF presence and some of the local council presence. Um, lessons learned. Burden sharing is the way to go. I think we've learned from having a coalition that we can come together and we can do pretty incredible things. Um, ensuring that your scope is very limited on what you want to achieve and then scaling up, as the SAR mentions, um, is a good way to do it. Large scale reconstruction efforts will not be sustainable if the security environment isn't stabilized. Um, Obviously, that's going to be a huge issue in Syria. It's becoming a big issue in Iraq. Um, but a two-pronged military and stabilization campaign is a really good model um, when you have a coalition and you have um, a limited scope of what you're trying to do. Um, 
I think that's all I have to say. The, the problem is that we're always going to have an ambiguous political environment in areas where we're conducting stabilization operations. So it's about ensuring that you're maximizing gains um, while still dealing with that ambiguity. Thanks, Liz. Um, that was also um, great. And um, I want just to um, sort of do, do a little bit about up here on, on the panel before I, I open it up, also because we had questions earlier to the Assistant Secretary. Uh, with, um, so I, um, I was reading two articles uh, recently on this. One was by um, Gail Lemon, um, the, the journalist. And I, she had sort of, after a visit to, uh, to Raqqa, this uh, where um, she was saying, to, today, so many Americans have learned the lessons of U.S. ineffectiveness in the region, the Middle East, so well that they failed to register a story of a policy gone largely right across two administrations. So I both wanted you sort of to, to react to that. Um, and then second was reading um, uh, Brett McGurk, the former uh, ISIL envoy in the Foreign Affairs, who had a really uh, good article, the question of can you do uh, more with less? When comes sort of the, the breaking point and you have to reduce the number of priorities you can do if you don't have, uh, you were touching upon some of this list as well, if you don't have the military backing behind it and so were your friends. And so I thought one is, is sort of optimistic uh, and I thought I wanted to be a little bit uh, devil's advocate to add so a little bit of optimism saying is it a policy that's actually gone largely unnoted that if you look back a decade where um, Americans were fed up with using enormous amount of money in, in, in Iraq and here you've actually had a sort of relatively light touch and you do have um, at least in some of the aggregate numbers some successes with return of, of um, uh, displaced uh, persons to a, to a large uh, degree. So um, so wanted to have like your short uh, comments on that and then we can uh, open it up for, um, so uh, Linda, why don't we start with you? Yes, that's great. I, I, I like asking us to sum up and I do think, um, uh, Liz called it burden sharing, General Votel called it by, with and through. I think it's been a, a huge and important example of how a military campaigns should be conducted, uh, full stop. Uh, and it should be a model going forward. It's been the least covered military campaign in our history. Um, so it's very important to understand the components of that. However, as we've all been saying, the job isn't done. It takes some strategic patience. I do see Iraq as a glass half full. We have a country and partners that want us there. And it, it's shame on us if we don't find a way to work, work with them to achieve both the objectives of consolidating the gains in the counter-ISIS campaign and working through the Iranian problem. Because I guarantee you, Iraqi nationalism is our strongest card to leverage and play in that regard. Uh, Syria, I'm far more pessimistic. And I appreciate the fine-grained analysis of my co-panelists. But the fact is we're lacking the will. So the US does not want to put more Schlitz into this effort. That's become quite clear. We have a duly elected president, and he's made his views clear. Uh, and that means we don't have enough leverage to accomplish our objectives. And we need to clearly rack and stack what we need to do. First of all, 2,000 foreign fighters are there and need to have a, what the military calls a judicial finish. We need to get a hold of these people, and these SDF should not be uh, forced to be the um, uh, prison guards for these people indefinitely. There are another 8,000 Iraqi and Syrian fighters that also need to be uh, disposed of, and the IDPs include uh, some collaborators and sleeper cells. And on the, we don't have the ability to do stabilization there. If you look at the trends, the regime is consolidating its territory with the support of Russia and Iran, and that is the clear direction it's going. Does Damascus negotiate with the SDF to provide some kind of, and it's in the regime's interest, to use some of the ability of SDF, they've never had a particular problem with them, uh, to work out an eventual outcome. So I think it's time for us to be brutally honest about Syria. Thanks. Francis, your thoughts? Uh, one to two minutes, but then we try to go through, and then we'll open up for a couple of last questions. Agree entirely uh, with, with Linda's points. Uh, quickly on Gail Lamont's uh, argument, as I understand it, I mean, I agree with her. I think that there, um, 
we on the U.S. side were chastened by the experience of uh, stabilization in Afghanistan and earlier versions of Iraq, the sort of mega efforts. I think we were right to be chastened. Um, that, and the model that was employed, uh, this go around, the by, with, and through, I think, had a lot to bring to the table. We also had a very capable <clears throat> partner, um, which obviously helps. Um, but I think there's a lot to, of good to be learned there, and I hope we, we all focus on that as well. Um, on the sort of can you do more with less, uh, I have to agree you cannot do more with less. Um, I think that the key part in Syria, has been, as has been indicated, is that perhaps we could do more or slightly more with slightly less if we had clarity of mission, clarity of communication, clarity of our convening power to bring partners on board. I mean, the story of global coalition, um, as Elizabeth noted, has been a story of bringing, marshalling partners to this common me effort. And, I agree. I think it's been a tremendous success. Uh, and I think, in general, burden sharing has a lot to offer. Um, but I, I do think, in order to do that, burden sharing doesn't equal sort of state of nature chaos. Everybody sort of raise their hand and do what they want to do. It really requires clarity of overarching umbrella mission. And I think that the US uh, has to be the one to lead the way on that. Uh, finally, I agree with Linda's point on sort of where is this all going politically. I didn't get into this. but. Um, the, the military security tides of the conflict are pretty clear, and I think we need to be um, pretty sober-eyed about that, um, rather than wishing away that that were not the case. So. Yeah, I just uh, I also agree with both of them of what they say. Uh, we need to continue to have a, uh, a strategy for the uh, for the forces on the ground on on how to deal with them, how to how to uh, create uh, one solid security force on the ground and bring everybody together so we can at least uh, uh, be, we be part of that plan. And uh, we hope, I mean, there is a, uh, as you know, in, in uh, uh, U.S. training forces on the ground, 1.4 billion or 1.3 billion. Uh, I hope this money will be delivered on the, on the, one, on, on the uh, right way to, to those forces to be trained. And uh, we need to continue of addressing the problems that people are facing. Uh, what is the best for the country? What is the best for the people in a state of, of acting a different way? Uh, so uh, in Syria as well, uh, I mean, uh, SDF is having problem with, with what Turkey is trying to do. So uh, I, I agree to have some safe zones uh, on, on the ground uh, to be controlled and monitored by the coalition, by the international community. Um, in case to avoid any tragedy of, of attacking each other uh, again. And yeah, so that's what uh, I believe. So I, I think everybody else has said it perfectly well, and I, I would wholeheartedly agree. Um, I think at this point it's about prioritizing our policy objectives in both Iraq and Syria. So in Iraq, if it's having a stable, secure, um, one government Iraq, then that means we need to not put as much pressure on some of the sanctions like with Iran and ensuring that um, you know, we're encouraging the Iraqi government to you know, conduct good governance and things like that. In Syria, our policy objectives are just so far and above what we can do, and that's creating massive problems and chaos on the ground. I would agree the writing on the wall um, is there for the Syrian civil war. It's, it's time for us to at least not impede SDF regime negotiations. I think it's inevitable, especially with us leaving or, or scaling down, that um, that that's going to happen sooner rather than later. It's better for it to happen sooner when we're still there and can influence and help shape that um, than it happens when we leave and it's all fallen apart. It would be great if all of our stabilization and policy goals could be tied up in a neat little package, but it, that never happens. Um, so we kind of just have to deal um, with what we're given. And um, now I think it's time for our policy goals to match our stabilization goals. Thanks, Liz. Well, audience, you've been uh, patient. I promise to give you a question so I can get one or two, and, and then we'll get it back to the panel, and then we'll round up in the usual time. So one question down here, one here, and the last one there. Um, and then we'll take all three of them together, and we'll uh, do answers from up here and round up at the same time. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Mr. Luay. You have mentioned Mr. Fal Hilfiyar. Fal Hilfiyar has nothing to do with our topic today. But uh, just for you, uh, Fal Hilfiyar is a, a, a politician. He is a former advisor 
for national security, and he is now he's the head of the popular uh, mo the head of popular mobilization. This is one. The problem, the the the, the minorities or the Iraqi components problem. You you did you did great, but you did, you didn't touch exact what you have to say. You know, this one of one of major problem of the Christian, let's say, they are divided. They are divided, and they are, some of them, they are with the Kurds, uh, some of them, they are with the Iraqi government, as you mentioned. But Can we it, turn it into a question? No, no, it, it is just a comment, okay. because it is very important, really, because our, I mean, the Iraqi government policy, it's to protect the minorities. It is, this is not minorities. It is wrong to say minorities because they are a very important component of the Iraqi society. Mm -hmm. So this is a problem. The problem is other. You don't want to touch it. If, we, if you would like, we can discuss. Oh, absolutely. I will, I will give you my comments. Okay, okay. Yeah, let's, and we'll just try to do it, and we'll get you to, well, to enter. Hi, my name is Fred Peterson. Previously worked for the House and the Senate. Also served with the Marines in OIF-1 and the Second Battle of Fallujah. My question would be, how effective do you think legislation passed by Congress, which would set clear objectives for withdrawal and or reducing troop numbers, could go in reassuring our allies and ensuring we don't pull a repeat of 2011? And I had a last one down there, and then we'll turn it back to the... Hi, uh, Timothy D. with the Tucker Institute. Uh, recently in the Iraqi legislature, there have been proposals calling for a review of U.S. forces uh, present in Iraq. Uh, some of these bills are as extreme as Iraqi forces uh, confronting U.S. forces. Others are calling for a review of international agreements uh, between the U.S. and Iraq. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could speak on how any of these bills may impact stabilization and reconstruction efforts in Iraq and complicate the relationship between the U.S. and Syria, and excuse me, Iraq. Thanks, good question. I think, Luar, we'll start with you. There were a lot of... Um, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the reason I mentioned Farah al-Fayyad, uh, you said head of the Hajj al-Shabi or PMU, for us is not an official position, because we don't believe... I don't... Uh, we, we, not, yeah, yeah, I understand that. I understand that. It's just, it's a state institution, but if you go to talk to people on the ground, many of them, they don't want to see to be under Hajj al-Shabi. I'm, I'm not saying I, I, I wish. They, they report back to the prime minister, okay, but in, in, uh, in theory, believe me, it's, uh, I, I, this is what I believe. Uh, this is what I, it's my, like, uh, what I see. Uh, there are many of them, what, like, there's no, ice, there's no ISIS, many... After ISIS, few explosions happened in, in, in Mosul were created by Hajj al-Shabi to remain on the city, my friend, you know? So this is why... Uh, we yeah, will yeah. discuss more afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm just saying that because this is what we hear. This is what we hear from the ground. This is what, what I... In, in my contact with people on the ground. But uh, you said minorities. We don't call them... Look, Cardinal Sacco, one week ago, he made a statement was he was very frustrated about he says people Iraqi politicians came to me and they say oh you, you don't say we are minorities we don't we don't call you minorities we call you indigenous people on the uh, on, of the Iraq and he replied back he said what do you mean indigenous people we've been we've been excluded from the jobs he mentioned in his statement specifically few ministries as Christian, they want to apply a job. They've been excluded from those jobs. And those people are doctors, engineers, who have PhD, master degrees. They, we've been excluded. You can, you, cannot, you can tell me, OK, you are indigenous. We're trying to protect minorities. But on the ground, it's not that. On the ground, it's different. When you go and speak with people and tell, look, we've been divided. I agree. You, you're 100% right. But that should be not should be a pretext of not coming, sending somebody to an plane and ask our, about our condition. Where, did, did any committee from any ministry or prime minister has been sent to those area to speak with, leader, with their leadership? What is your need? No. no nobody has been done that. If you want to build the church, if you want to build the, the, the a mosque, or if you want to build the house or school, that, doesn't, that does not must stop you because we are, we are divided. No. The church, it, you can go and build it. Doesn't matter. Nobody will say don't build it. 
or the, the road, or you want to build, build roads, or provide electricity. That is, that, that doesn't have to do with our division. We are divided politically, but we are not divided to have electricity. We are not divided to rebuild our church. Thanks, John. Um, Liz, I wanted maybe you on can Congress shore up uh, allies? You, you talked a lot of this, and we had a question here whether if Congress sort of put down some markers, could that um, help? Yeah, I think we have to be careful about over-regulating these sorts of issues um, because we're going to make mistakes like this. This, the last two years in particular, have been difficult because it's been a seesaw of decisions and policy making. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how to fix that. I'm not sure if we want it to be congressionally mandated. Um, it would certainly make our allies, um, you know, have their commitment be there. And, and most of our allies have to do that too. So it's certainly something worth discussing. I'm just not sure what the appetite would be either on the Hill or um, in the executive branch. Linda? Any last yes, I'll just say I think as a as a Marine, you would know the military likes to have conditions based and not uh, dictated force levels. But I think a sign from Congress that it's very important to remain and achieve our goals, and I think that support is vital. And the second P, if I understood, the Iraqi Parliament has a lot of uh, uh, churn going on, but Speaker Halbusi has been very clear. Uh, about it, and as long uh, the the desire for the U.S. to stay in Iraq to support the agreed on missions is is there, and he actually has the authority to bring bills or not to a vote. So I think that is actually kind of bubbled up, and now people understand that's not an immediate threat. However, we need to understand it's through the Iraqi government that we are going to achieve our policy objectives. We. No more questions. We can't we can make talk it. On the yeah, we can talk afterwards. I mean, I, I like to also with my panelists that we keep on time. I've actually let us overflow with four, uh, five minutes this time, but only because it was, it was so good. So I want you to um, uh, help me give a hand to our panelists and thank them for the discussion today. Thank you.